it's time to get started and to introduce our keynote speaker. I would like to thank all of you for being here today to listen to Professor Richard Cohen. Let me introduce him briefly. But first, I would like uh, to inform you that there will be a, a, a question and answer period at the end of the keynote speech, and that you are supposed to ask the question directly from the floor. So please move forward close to the stage so that we can hear you and to create a more intimate environment. Uh, especially this section maybe can move forward. Uh, also, I inform you uh, that Professor Cohen is available for a book signing at the end of uh, this session. Professor Richard Cohen is a, is a sweet, distinguished professor of Judaic Studies in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of North Carolina. He devoted more than two decades to, study, to the study of Emmanuel Levinas, his translation of two of Levinas' important works, Ethics and Infinity and Time and the Other, were a significant contribution that spurred the study of Levinas in the United States. Moreover, Professor Cohen edited in 1986 a collection of essays on Levinas entitled Face to Face with Levinas. And more recently, in 1994, he published a book on Levinas and Rosenzweig entitled Elevations, The Height of Good in Rosenzweig and Levinas, published by the uh, University uh, of Chicago Press. This uh, volume and all of uh, Professor Cohen's work is, of course, dedicated to the highest standards of scholarship, and more importantly, his work strives to attain successfully an elevation higher than that of knowledge and intellect alone, and testifies to the moral heights of life, the same heights toward which the writings of Levinas and Rosenzweig point. Today he will speak on what good is the Holocaust, Levinas on evil and suffering. Please welcome Professor Richard Cohen. Thank you, Professor uh, Rolini. I'm grateful to be here in Oregon at uh, such a very stimulating conference. What good is the Holocaust? The question is provocative and perhaps perverse because the Holocaust is not a good, but an evil. Nevertheless, good can come out of evil. The question would then mean, what good comes from that evil, the Holocaust? Right away, an answer that's heard time and again is the state of Israel. The good issuing from the destruction of European Jewry would be the creation of the State of Israel. The relation between the two would not simply be one of recompense, as if there could be recompense for the suffering and death of innocence, or for any suffering and death. Rather, the State of Israel would be understood as a haven where Jews would never again be subject to a Holocaust owing to the defenselessness which comes from living in foreign lands and having no state of one's own. In this way, the evil of the Holocaust, while remaining evil, would be the cause of good for Jews, for the survivors, and for future generations. But the question, what good is the Holocaust, is not restricted to Jews. The Holocaust, after all, was not perpetrated by the Jews though the Jews were, of course, its primary victims. The perpetrators, collaborators, and supporters, as well as those vast numbers who were or seemed indifferent, the bystanders, were the more or less active agents of evil. Thus, the evil of the Holocaust implicates not the Nazis or the Germans alone, nor even is it confined to Europe or the West. From 1933 to 1945, 
all the nations of the world witness the martyrdom of Israel and yet could find no place in their lands to shelter this small people threatened with genocide, nor a place in their hearts to counter an anti-Semitism that progressed rapidly and openly from hatred to murder. Is there good then that comes from such an evil, one in which the entire world is implicated? In a seeming paradox, the answer is the same, the state of Israel. The Third Reich represented a virulent form of the very callousness that implicated all the nations of the world. One can call it statism, the primacy of reasons of state above moral reasons. For the Third Reich, beneath and through its labyrinthine formalism, might made right. Of course, Hitler's Germany also espoused an old and trenchant ideology of culture. The idea that humanity is a kind of vegetation where humans grow and flourish, not in and through their moral autonomy, but in a kind of symbiotic autochthony, a natural enrootedness linking blood and soil where soil is differentiated into fatherlands, or in a sweeter but no less misguided version is globalized as Mother Earth. The state of Israel, in contrast, would represent a higher dignity for humanity and for the Earth, the latter understood as creation. It would represent the exceptional status of a state with all that statehood requires of armies and police, a state inaugurated in goodness, created by the orderly vote of United Nations, and dedicated to human welfare and justice. For Israel's ancient spirituality, this inauguration and status would reflect the image of God's immemorial covenant with Abraham and the Jewish people, the unique status of country and citizenship maintained not by might alone, but by power serving social justice, power obedient to moral command. We are still moved by Prime Minister Golda Meir's lament for the Jewish casualties of Israeli-Arab wars when she paid tribute to the death of Jewish soldiers by acknowledging the even greater horror of Jews having been forced to kill. Nationalism, land, and statehood conceived on this model, this utopian model in the sense that Professor Bernstein spoke of utopia yesterday, would thus exemplify and signify a universal vision and vocation for an enlightened humanity. Israel and the state of Israel would be chosen, a nation of priests, a light unto the nations, because, as Levinas writes, quote, in Israel's destiny, human universality transpires and is being accomplished." End of quote. From the global evil of the Holocaust, a good would come from, for all humanity, the state of Israel. That is to say, justice before power. Such is also, thank God, the American vision too. These would be Levinasian reflections on the familiar connection linking the destruction of European Jewry and the creation of the State of Israel. But Levinas has other thoughts too, thoughts more intimately associated with the horror of the Holocaust, closer, that is to say, to the unimaginable pain, to suffering and evil beyond measure. What good is the Holocaust? What good does it serve? These questions renew the most questionable of all questions, the question of evil. What is the purpose of evil? Does evil serve any good? This question is most questionable, not in the sense that it is ever wrong-headed to ask questions, and not at all because of the profound challenge it has always posed for religion, for a divine benevolence and providence, nor even in this instance 
because the overwhelming and unashamed evil of the Holocaust once and for all upsets and overthrows all theological explanations. But also, and here is the depth that Levinas will plumb and explore, because unlike philosophical questions, because more important and better than philosophical questions, it is a question that does not leave all answers open. What is questioned by the question of evil, then, is the nature of questioning. It questions the tentativeness, the open horizon, the freedom, which are so seductive as to be almost constitutive of philosophy, but in which Levinas will see a lack of moral commitment, the temptation of always being tempted. For unlike the question of being, for instance, to be or not to be, the question of evil allows no evasion, deferral, temporizing, or exit. The relation invoked by this question does not conform to philosophy's three modalities, possibility, probability, or necessity, whether causal or logical. It calls forth and calls into question another sort of relation with a different basis and standard, not true and false, but good and evil. Not simply rightness, but more deeply, righteousness. Not simply justification, but more deeply, justice. The terms good and evil are at once and inextricably declarative and prescriptive. And they are not symmetrical. Evil is not the simple reverse of good, nor good the simple reverse of evil. Just as up and down are not simple opposites, but have completely different relations to gravity. But Levinas is not interested in the abstract concept or the formal idea or the linguistic usage of good or evil. Rather, his concern is goodness, acts of kindness and compassion. He cites the words of Ikonikov of Vasily Grossman's book, Life and Fate. Ikonikov says, quote, there is not God, there is not good, there is goodness end of quote. As for evil, that will be the topic of this paper. In contrast to the philosophical modalities which apply to objects and ideas, the relation and issue here in the question of evil is one of persons, hence of complexities and difficulties, and all the intricacies and refinements of interhuman relations, relations of the heart and of law. Writers and artists such as Vasily Grossman, Elie Wiesel, Primo Levi, as, as Professor Lolini has, has just shown, I think, quite conclusively, give testimony to this world. Philosophers have never been able to escape this rich and teeming world, but too often they have tried. The ethical world is deep and wide, including this world and all worlds. In an ocean, Jews call Torah, or Talmud. At bottom, as Levinas will teach, what is at issue is suffering and the relief of suffering. It is a world which ultimately stands on one pillar alone, the weakest pillar, compassion. The theological explanation for evil, the Odyssey, is that evil is willed by God, willed by an absolute God an absolutely benevolent God. The logic may be painful in the sense that it outrages moral reason, but it remains logical for all that. Since God wills all things, God willed the Holocaust. Because all things willed by God are good, the Holocaust too was good. Not just that good comes from the Holocaust, but that the Holocaust itself was good, as repentance, sacrifice, purification, sign, redemption, punishment, perhaps all of these, but ultimately good in itself. Not only do such scandalous conclusions necessarily follow from the logic of a philosophical God, from an absolute omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, and benevolence, 
But even more painfully and intimately, they follow from the personal God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, from his special covenant with the Jews, and in our day with Israel in its passion under Adolf Hitler. Part of holy history, the Holocaust, above all, would have been willed by God, and thus would be good. It would have to be good, or it would be meaningless and the Jews forsaken. As we know, this very line of thought, enunciated in 1961 by a leading German cleric whose moral heroism had earlier been proven saving Jews during the Nazi period, so shocked Richard Rubenstein that he rejected altogether any belief in a special election of Israel. Levinas, too, is shocked by this sound but appalling logic. Like Rubenstein, he too rejects the Odyssey, the vindication of evil in terms of divine justice. But he does not, in contrast, reject God or the idea of Jewish election. How can one affirm God, Israel's election, and ethics after the Holocaust? We are driven to ask anew what sense, if any, do religion and morality have if human affairs are divorced from divine justice? Is a God who hides his face or is eclipsed any different than no God at all? If the rejection of theodicy leaves those for whom God is still meaningful with a tremendum, is it no more than a clouding of consciousness, an elliptical but false gesture, a brave but empty stubbornness? Levinas answers in the negative. After the Holocaust, to be sure, he rejects the Odyssey. Indeed, the meaning of the Holocaust is precisely for Levinas the end of the Odyssey. Quote, the most revolutionary fact of our 20th century is that of the destruction of all balance between the Odyssey and the forms which suffering and evil take. Quote, the Holocaust of the Jewish people is the paradigm of gratuitous human suffering where evil appears in all its horror. Quote, Auschwitz, the radical rupture between evil and mercy, between evil and sense. End of quote. The question of evil remains. This most questionable question, as old as Job, is in fact newly deepened, newly sharpened, radicalized by the Holocaust. Levinas does not shirk from asking, what can suffering mean when suffering is rendered so obviously useless, inutil, useless to its core? What can suffering mean when it is, quote, for nothing? When it heralds and leads only to death and is intended only for obliteration? Friedrich Nietzsche was also troubled by, quote, the meaninglessness of suffering. Like Levinas, but of course decades before the Holocaust, he too rejected as false and self-deceptive all the justifications of suffering as the Odyssey, punishment for sin, a piece of a larger whole. But with the same stroke, Nietzsche rejects all interpretations whatsoever for suffering. Why so hard, the piece of coal asks the diamond. Why so soft, the diamond replies. Nietzsche's readers are acutely aware of the concluding section of the third book of On the Genealogy of Morals, where after having masterfully tracked down and categorically rejected the ascetic ideal, the Odyssey, in all its multifarious forms, both gross and subtle, Nietzsche challenges himself and his readers with the regretful admission that fundamentally no other interpretation of suffering has existed hitherto. Quote, it was the only meaning offered so far. For himself, Nietzsche answers with a brave but fantastic heralding of yet another Messiah, Zarathustra, eternal recurrence, the overman. Agreeing with Nietzsche's rejection of theodicy, the only meaning offered so far to suffering, Levinas takes up the challenge, but articulates another response, where suffering and evil, without losing and without denying their essentially useless character, nonetheless retain a meaning for religion and morality. 
Levinas takes up the topics of evil and suffering, the end of theodicy, and what he calls a new modality of faith today, that is to say the topic of ethics after the Holocaust, in three short articles comprising 24 pages in all, published at four-year intervals in 1978, 82, and 86. And unless otherwise indicated, all my citations are from these three articles. The first is entitled Transcendence and Evil. It is a creative review of Philip Nemo's book, Job and the Excess of Evil, also published in 1978. The second article, entitled Useless Suffering, and the third article, the, the only one that hasn't been translated, The Call of Auschwitz, invoke the Holocaust and Emil Fackenheim's book, God's Presence in History, which appeared in French translation in 1980. The third article, The Call of Auschwitz, concludes, as we will ourselves conclude later, by referring back to another short article of 1955, Levinas's response one decade after the Holocaust, entitled, Loving the Torah More Than God. Um, Sander Goodhart cited that article yesterday. The three articles work as most of Levinas's writings work by progressively building on original phenomenological and ethical insights by means of review and elaboration, circling back to retrieve, extrapolate, and amplify earlier thoughts. It progresses, that is to say, as an ever-deepening commentary upon its own insights, like Talmud, re-saying its own said. These three articles work precisely that way. They all develop, in different proportions and depth, three basic components. They begin with a phenomenology of evil and suffering. Then, building on these intuitions and insights, they turn to ethics, negatively to criticize the Odyssey, as we have already seen positively to propose an ethical alternative, which we shall see shortly. In the following, I will trace this same route, beginning with suffering and evil, and concluding with Levinas's positive religico-ethical alternative to the Odyssey. Phenomenology uncovers two primary and related dimensions to suffering. One, excess or transcendence. Two, meaninglessness. Because of these two dimensions, because they are fundamental, suffering is then linked to evil, evil in oneself and evil in another. Suffering appears in and as extreme passivity, a passivity, quote, more passive than receptivity, quote, an ordeal more passive than experience. The passivity of suffering is extreme or excessive because of its quality of unassumability, non-integratability. This quality of excess and transcendence, which makes up its essence, cannot be understood quantitatively. Little and great suffering are both suffering. The too much of pain is its very essence, manner, quiddity. Suffering, that is to say, is not only a suffering from something, as Husserl's commitment to intentional analysis would suggest, but also, at the same time, a suffering from suffering itself, a redoubling of suffering, such that all suffering, regardless of its quantitative measure, and regardless of whether it is endured voluntarily or not, is unwanted, insupportable, unbearable of itself. The unwanted and inescapable corporeal reflexivity this unwanted and inescapable corporeal refl reflexivity is what distinguishes the phenomenon of suffering. One suffers from suffering itself. From the inherent excess of suffering comes its second characteristic, and it's linked to evil, meaninglessness. Despite a variety of post facto explanations and finalities that pain serves as a biological warning or is the price of spiritual refinement, or of social and political regeneration. Quote, the nonsense of pain pierces beneath reasonable forms. Levinas writes of suffering, quote, in its own phenomenality, intrinsically it is useless for nothing. End of quote. As such, it is monstrosity, nonsense par excellence, the absurd, 
basic senselessness, the disturbing and foreign of itself. Quote, the evil of pain, the harm itself, is the explosion and most profound articulation of absurdity. Quote, the break with the normal and the normative, with order, with synthesis, with the world, already constitutes its qualitative essence. Unbearable and useless, suffering is evil. Suffering is evil, evil is suffering. Together, they are the zero point, quote, where the dimensions of the physical and moral are not yet separated, unquote. All evil, Levinas writes, refers to suffering. It is not, he continues, through passivity that evil is described, but through evil that suffering is understood. Sickness, evil in living, aging, corruptible flesh, perishing, rotting. In the end, suffering and evil are names for the meaningless painfulness of pain, which is always, regardless of quantitative considerations, intrinsically excessive, unwanted, not to be accommodated. From this unwanted burden comes Levinas's first articulation of an ethical issue, the fundamental ethical problem which pain poses, pain for nothing. The ethical problem is not the sufferers, the one subject to the pain of meaningless suffering, but that of we ourselves in relation to the sufferer. Quote, the inevitable and preemptory ethical problem of the medication which is my duty. End of quote. In the other suffering then, Levy now sees an original call for aid, an original call for curative help. Quote, where the primordial, irreducible, and ethical, anthropological category of the medical comes to impose itself across a demand for analgesia. Earlier, in 1961, in Totality and Infinity, Levinas had already written, quote, the doctor is an a priori principle of human mortality. There, he contested one of the central claims of Heidegger's being in time, that dying or being toward death isolates and individualizes human subjectivity. For Levinas, in contrast, a social conjunction is maintained in this menace of death which, quote, renders possible an appeal to the other, to his friendship and his medication, end of quote. The evil of suffering then, meaningless for the sufferer, would at once be an appeal to the other, a demand for analgesia. These are Levinas's first and fundamental ethical elaborations of suffering, suffering as a call to, to help, as my obligation to help. But what if the other's call is silenced? As I have already indicated, the phenomenal or intrinsic meaninglessness of suffering and evil render them resistant to all theodicy. The enormity of the Holocaust would be the unforgettable and irrefutable historical proof, and henceforth a paradigmatic proof, of the essential disproportion between suffering and explanation. But Levinas goes one step further. After Auschwitz, theodicy itself becomes immorali immor immorality. The idea of theodicy may be a consolation for the sufferer, but from me, coming from me, it is my flight, rationalization, imposition, as if the other's suffering, meaningless to the sufferer, were meaningful to me. Quote, for an ethical sensibility confirming itself in the inhumanity of our time against this inhumanity, the justification of the neighbor's pain is certainly the source of all immorality, end of quote. That I can explain someone else's pain, that I can justify it, is to pile evil upon evil. But how, we must still ask, is it possible to retain an ethical sensibility beyond the nonsense of evil after the Holocaust? If suffering is intrinsically meaningless, and the Holocaust, the unavoidable global proof of this meaninglessness, the proof of the inapplicability of any explanation, then why and how can we still speak of evil and morality at all? This remains a fundamental question. How retain an ethical sensibility? Or, as Levinas expressed this in the now famous opening sentence of Totality and Infinity, which we heard yesterday, quote, everyone, this is Levinas's opening sentence of Totality and Infinity, Everyone will readily agree 
that it is of the highest importance to know whether or not we are duped by morality. Suffering and evil are intrinsically meaningless. The inordinate suffering and evil of the Holocaust make this evident, not only to diligent students of phenomenology or Nietzsche, but to the whole world and to all the religions of the world. Quote, the philosophical problem which is posed by the useless pain which appears in its fundamental malignancy across the events of the 20th century concerns the meaning that religiosity and the human morality of goodness can still retain after the end of the Odyssey." End of quote. There can be no doubt that it is precisely this philosophical problem that is at the bottom of the exigency for this very conference. What is Levinas's answer? Deepening his earlier formulations regarding the category of the medical and the a priori principle of the doctor, by holding fast to the phenomenon of suffering itself, Levinas's answer regarding the ethical religious meaning of suffering can be summed up in a simple but powerful statement as follows. The only sense that can be made of evil, that is to say of suffering, is to make one's own suffering into a suffering for the suffering of others. Or to put this in one word, the only ethical meaning of suffering, indeed, quote, the only meaning to which suffering is susceptible, unquote, is compassion. The other person suffers, that is evil. There is no moral or religious explanation for it. Indeed, such explanations are themselves immoral, irreligious. Suffering, in short, cannot be made into an object. And any attempt to do so, in whatever exalted name, is itself an immorality. But I am a being who suffers too. What Levinas is proposing then, without any mystical implications, is a kind of holy contagion, an almost sublime contagion of suffering. He is proposing that morality and religion can still make sense, indeed can only make sense after the Holocaust in, quote, suffering elevated or deepened to a suffering for the suffering of another person. The fundamental philosophical problem of suffering then, its evil, its meaninglessness, its malignancy, would then become, quote, the problem of the relationship between the suffering of the self and the suffering which a self can experience over the suffering of the other man. It is this empathy, this compassion, that would be the new modality of faith today. Quote, that in the evil that pursues me, the evil suffered by the other man affects me, touches me, end of quote. To take on in and as one's own affliction, the affliction of the other is not simply a feeling, however. It is for Levinas to be responsible to the other, responsible for the other. Morality and humanity, in other words, arise in a painful solidarity. But the humanity of the human occurs only across this narrow bridge of compassion a bridge which, despite its narrowness, is linked to all and everything. The humanity of man, Levinas writes, is fraternally solidary, end of quote, I'm going to interject, solidary not only with all humans, but even more it is, quote, fraternally solidary with creation. This is not, then, the human defined by its absorption into nature, whether nature be spirit or mother. Rather, it is nature uplifted to creation where across human responsibility, quote, responsibility for everything and for all, unquote, no one, not the greatest, not the least, no creature whatsoever, whether animal, vegetable, or mineral, is left out. Levinas will call this vast empathy, this vast compassion, this vast responsibility, theophany and revelation. Beyond theodicy, it is a compassion without concern for reward, recompense, remuneration. It is solar love. Putting the other above oneself, converting one's own suffering into a suffering for the other's suffering, quote, has no other recompense than this very elevation. This new devotion after the Holocaust then would be, 
quote, the ultimate vocation of our people, and hence the ultimate vocation of and for humanity. Quote, to give rather than receive, to love and make love rather than be loved. Such again would be Israel and humanity, and conceding nothing to Caesar, it would be the utopian reality of the state of Israel and of all the nations of the earth. In demanding that after the Holocaust, Jews remain faithful to the utter uttermost depths or heights of Judaism in a unique particularity, which always refers to the universal without ever giving up its particularity, as, as Diane uh, Perpich um, showed yesterday, Levinas several times invokes the demand of Emil Fackenheim that now, more than ever, Jews, and in this sense, everyone is a Jew, must deny Hitler a posthumous victory. Jews must remain Jews. After the Holocaust, in other words, humans must remain human. We must be servants, Levinas writes, citing Perke Avot, quote, who serve without regard to recompense. And this, he continues, circling back to his article of 1955, this new devotion and ultimate vocation after the Holocaust is nothing less than loving Torah more than God. In conclusion, then, let us turn to the vista opened up by Levinas's own conclusion. In 1955, Levinas had already written of suffering, God's absence, and the Holocaust. What, he asked then, can this suffering of the innocent mean? The answer is powerful and magnificent and true. I will cite it at length. Quote, the God who hides his face is not, I believe, a theological abstraction or poetic image. It is the moment in which the just individual can find no help. No institution will protect him. The consolation of divine presence to be found in infantile religious feeling is equally denied him, and the individual can prevail only through his conscience, which necessarily involves suffering. This is the specifically Jewish sense of suffering that at no stage assumes the value of a mystical atonement for the sins of the world. The condition of the victims in a disordered world that is to say, in a world where good does not triumph, is that of suffering. This condition reveals a God who renounces all aids to manifestation and appeals instead to the full maturity of the responsible person. The suffering of the just person for a justice that has no triumph is physically lived out as Judaism. The historical and physical Israel becomes once again a religious category. End of citation. It is through the Torah, then, through law dedicated to justice and justice bound to morality and morality emerging out of compassion, that is to say, through a life lived as what Levinas would consider continuing education in Torah, Education in Torah understood like justice and compassion as responsibility to others, that we discover, quote, the link between God and man. End of quote. Such is mature ethics and mature religion. Only the man, uh, quote, only the man who has recognized the hidden God can demand that God show himself. Loving Torah more than God, end of that quote, would then have two senses, and nothing would be more serious than the play between them. It would mean, first of all, loving God's commands, that is to say, law, loving the redemptive work of institutionalizing justice, the utopos of the state of Israel, which depends on the work of loving one's neighbor, on moral relations between humans, and loving all of these moral and juridical tasks more than one's own unmediated personal relationship with God. This is Buber's rejoinder to Kierkegaard. Marrying Regina, sanctifying God through the world, are not flight from purity and flight from God, but rather the very work that, the, that God demands of humans. Morality would be revelation, justice would be redemption. 
But loving Torah more than God would have a second sense too, unavoidable after the Holocaust. It would mean humans must love the work of morality and justice more apparently than does God himself. It would mean that even if God seems to have let us down, having hidden his face or having been eclipsed, as our 20th century teaches us time and again, that now all the more must we humans love the Torah, that is to say, do justice and love mercy. The prophet Isaiah taught the lofty lesson that God himself was afflicted by Israel's afflictions. After the Holocaust, Levinas is urging that we must take this burden upon ourselves, joining Yom Kippur to Purim, that regardless of God's silence or absence, we must be moved in our afflictions by the afflictions of our fellow humans. Perhaps only in this way, finally, without making any demands, without expecting any rewards, without reservation, without reserve, without miracles, can we for the first time as adults walk humbly with your God. Thank you. It's time now for the um, question and answer uh, period. I will ask the first question so to uh, let you prepare yours. Uh, and if you'd like to come uh, closer to the uh, stage, uh, it would be a good idea since you are supposed to ask the question directly from the floor. Uh, th this is just a quick question. Uh, um, Bruno Bettelheim uh, wrote once against the use of the word uh, Holocaust uh, because uh, he wrote this word as a religious implication and alludes to a kind of um, religious sacrifice. Uh, I wonder what is your thought about this? no problem using religious uh, terms <laughs> and even using them religiously. Um, I, I, uh, I liked the word uh, Holocaust, although if the conference had been called Ethics After the Shoah, I would have used the word Shoah. Um, uh, I accommodate myself to that. And I think what Levinas is saying is in some sense we are each of us the Holocaust. We, 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 each of us must in some sense internalize the Holocaust. That is, we are the suffering servants. It is our suffering that connects us to, uh, and unifies uh, humanity, but not, as I said in my paper, as a, as, a, as a simple feeling, as the feeling of a beautiful soul, but translated into the work of morality and justice. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, the word empathy, I, I, uh, if it has this connotation of uh, cognition, knowledge, epistemology, then, then that's, that's not the primary uh, sense that I'm looking for. But I think in the word pathos that, that empathy uh, takes up, we have what, what Levinas is looking for, that, uh, that's, uh, that sense of, uh, of understanding the other through one's own suffering, uh, the emphasis on the suffering. 
As for the difference between servant and sacrifice, it seems to me that the servant that we're, the service that we're talking about here is a sacrifice of one's nature. And by nature, I would mean the, uh, the, 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 what the Spinoza called conatus, what Levinas identifies as, as conatus, that is our, our natural inclination to persevere in our being, uh, to, to aggrandize what Nietzsche called the will to power. And uh, uh, in Totality of Infinity, Levinas speaks of ethics beginning in shame. It's only when we realize that we, facing the other, have the capacity to murder that other. Is the expression of the face of the other that says, thou shalt not murder, is my recognition of my capacity, my murderous capacity. And the recognition of my murderous capacity is, is, is already to sacrifice my will to domination, my will to power. Um, in the Marquis de Sade, uh, who opts for the will to power, uh, unrestrained, he says, if I can see the smallest possible discriminatable pleasure to my benefit, and it would cost me the sacrifice of all humanity, I would do it. That's how bad the will to power can be. <laughs> right? That's the most extreme form of the will to power. Excuse me, Professor Kahn, would you please repeat the question when they oh, are I'm asked? I'm sorry, that's right. For Thank you. For the television. Right. Um, right here, I guess. Yes. The question is, uh, if, uh, if we uh, see how really extreme the notion of responsibility for the other is in Levinas, it would include responsibility for that evil other who is afflicting the evil upon me, responsibility in a sense for the Nazis, that, or anybody evil. This is also recurs uh, criticism of, of Levinas. Um, Levinas answers that there's, there's two levels, at the level of morality. Uh, the Nazi retains humanity. I am responsible for that evil. That is, there's, there's nothing that frees me from my connection to that human being, as a human being. But, as he puts it, thank God there is a level of justice, in which case I am being mistreated, and uh, we have to rectify the, uh, the disequilibrium, the inequity, of, of the evil being perpetrated and, uh, and, and do all the things we're used to in this unredeemed world doing to evil people, putting them in jail, uh, punishing them, that sort of thing. It's the, uh, it's the sign, it's the indicator of the unredeemed character of our world that we have to do those things. Um, but he does not let us off the hook of responsibility even for evil. He takes it all upon himself. It's extreme. I think Professor Bernstein was, was, was very right in pointing out the radicality. Let me, let me go further back to a question. Um, I can hardly see where this, I'm, I'm gonna go back first. So way back there. Yeah, that's you. Um, I don't, I don't think he would uh, do that. I think that, t that sort of tampering is uh, so extreme in terms of thousands of years of developed uh, Jewish tradition that the, uh, the price of that tampering outweighs the benefit. I, I just don't, he never has done that, taken that move. And I, don't, I don't see how that would fit. The consequences of what Kushner does uh, are enormous. For Levinas, we, Loving the Torah more than God means the Torah has been given to us and given to all of us. And in the most general sense, it means we have thousands of years of uh, moral history. It's not like science where whatever's happening latest is the newest and undoes everything that happened beforehand. We, we've been given uh, and we've developed a moral sensibility. 
and, and I think he would find that move damaging to that heritage. But I, just a, a thought. Um, I'm going to go here first, and then we'll come back. The question then was how would Levinas respond uh, given this uh, notion I've set forth of the utopos of the state of Israel, how would uh, Levinas or myself respond to the apparent injustices uh, perpetrated on the, as it were, native Palestinian population? Is that, does that capture it? Right. Uh, my answer very simply is that uh, Israel is a uh, certainly relative to any Arab state in the Middle East, a far more just state, and that is a good thing for everyone there. Um, and, and if we go beyond that, we're going to enter into such complicated discussions <laughs> that, uh, that uh, it would be interminable. Um, but uh, uh, I think my, f my initial answer sort of sets the tone, I think, for what you'd hear me say. Uh, I don't believe there are any great injustices uh, perpetrated, not at all. Which book is it? No, no. It's a very complicated issue with many points of view. Um, but I would say this, that the standard by which we would measure both sides is the same standard that I'm defending here. That is, if the, uh, if the cause that you're defending is just, I believe you'd be relying on the same point of view. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to follow up, but, but we had just behind you, there's so many people and, sorry. Point well taken in the uh, citation from the Loving Torah More Than God article. Uh, apparently, there are, well, it's always a problem uh, in, from the French to the English because the one term can be translated both as consciousness or conscience. And um, I think Sander is right that if we use the word conscience, then we're falling back on a kind of um, natural morality like Hutchison. Uh, relying on a certain sensibility that either some people have or they don't. And that's not Levinas's sense. It's that consciousness itself, the, uh, the vigilance, the awakefulness of being conscious is a function of the prod, the moral prod of being in relationship to others. That's a good point. Thank you. Uh, Professor Bernstein.
Okay. Uh, let, me, let me go to the easiest answer uh, first, which would be your second point. So much the better if this is Christianity. I remember a discussion in Israel, uh, Hebrew University. I forget the topic. And someone said, but that's what, they, that's what Christianity said. And the answer was, so what? <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, what difference does it make? Uh, that would be wonderful if this was also the Christian view. I'd be marvelous. Um, in fact, uh, I found a, uh, uh, I just uh, was glancing in a, in a bookstore very recently, a book by a, a Christian uh, writing as a theologian, um, Stanley Hauer, Hauer of us, if you know his work. He has a book called God, Medicine, and Suffering, published in 1990. He says exactly what Levinas says. I thought, how marvelous, how wonderful. Um, the first question, though, is the tougher one. Um, sure, evil can take more sophisticated forms. That is, my first answer would be, this is the root form, that the association of evil and suffering is the, is the, is the ground of all accounts of, 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 of evil. And it can have more complicated, sophisticated forms. But uh, your question is deeper than that. Um, why do I say this is the root form? How can I say it's just deeper? Uh, and here I rely, uh, again, uh, people could disagree, and that's why we have a debate in academia. I rely on the strength of the phenomenological method. Uh, I'm, I'm a believer in this uh, philosophical method as, as the one uh, with which we find and discover, uh, enunciate truth. Uh, the beauty of Levinas's form of phenomenology is that he he aims for those moments of excess. He finds those precise points where the scientific discovery of truth breaks down from an ethical point of view. And this is a, this is a perfect instance um, where he says the physical and the moral intersect so that the phenomenon we begin with, because phenomenology as a science has to look at a certain phenomenon, is the phenomenon of suffering. And Levinas discovers we cannot understand suffering unless we introduce the notion of evil, which is to say the interhuman relation, the intersubjective relation. Um, beyond that, uh, I would have to say, show me a better approach. If I was younger, you'd have a better shot at it. <laughs> uh, here's a question. Okay. Um, Levinas has a very broad idea of uh, Jew, Judaism, Torah, Talmud. Uh, in its narrower sense, it would be that which applies to that particular people, that confessional or covenantal group, the, the Jews, as the proven and best long-term method we've got. It's established itself. It's our way of being good. It's uh, our, our approach to justice. Um, but he never hesitates to, uh, I don't want to exactly say the word generalize, but to see this applicable to all of humanity. Um, th that we need law, I don't think it is in question. In order to have justice, we must have law. Uh, that we don't need specifically uh, the, the, the halakhic law of the Talmud, I don't think Levinas would debate, but that the approach of the Talmud, the kind of discussion, the kind of intricate interaction between the the human and the legal, he would, I believe, insist on. It's a deliberative process. Uh, it's very similar to, uh, although not exactly like, uh, case law. Uh, so there are parallels outside the Jewish world. I believe, although there's nothing to show this in black and white, but I'm convinced of it, that Levinas was influenced by a, a very um, important Italian uh, rabbi of the late 19th century who happened to have been a Kabbalist who published his major work in French. It was called uh, Humanity and uh, Israel, or Israel and Humanity. Uh, uh, his name was Rabbi Elijah ben -Muzig. And ben -Muzig argued that when you say Israel, you, can, you mean humanity. 
And he, he is actually the, the founder of this, this uh, emphasis you see sometimes today in what's called the Noahide laws. That is the way Jew Judaism looks at righteousness. Because Judaism demands righteousness of the whole world. But it doesn't demand that the whole world follow the halacha. Um, I think Levinas very much buys into Rabbi ben Amozik's idea that uh, where you say Israel, you can say humanity. This book was um, published in France in 1919. It's now in English, very abbreviated form, uh, Israel and Humanity. It's an important work. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's where we start. Well, the, the point, the, the question then is how do we distinguish at the level of phenomenology, phenomenality, uh, moral suffering from pathological suffering? Uh, the answer is not, it's not so difficult because uh, the suffering that we're speaking about in terms of empathetic or compassionate suffering is not entirely at the phenomenal level. That's already the eruption of the ethical. So it's simply a contestation of the, you could say, ethical efficacy of certain forms of empathetic suffering that would lead us to think of them as pathological. And usually we, we characterize as pathological the suffering that creates even more suffering. Um, but that would be a moral and not a phenomenological question. It's at the phenomenal level we get transcendence and meaninglessness, which inevitably, inexorably forces us to understand it in terms of evil. So the phenomenal level is, uh, you'd have to contest whether this is excessive, whether it's uh, meaningless. Yeah. Although I think Al Lingus, the, you know, the great translator of the most important works by Levinas, Totality and Infinity, Otherwise in Being, uh, tries to explore that dimension of uh, the pathological. But it's a moral question. That's what it's. Yes, Professor uh, Ryan. I can't distinguish. <laughs> That's an excellent question. Uh, the question was, uh, insofar as Levinas uh, does not seem to use a quantitative measure to specify uh, the nature of suffering, uh, what then is special about the Holocaust? What, what about magnitude in suffering? Um, it's a good question. It forces us to think uh, about what Levinas is up to. If we were sensitive enough, I think we would see that the, pick of a, the, the prick of a pin would be sufficient to undermine theodicy from Levinas's point of view. A world in which you would suffer from a pinprick would be enough. But as I said in my paper, what the Holocaust does is that for those people who are not phenomenologists or readers of Nietzsche, 
It is, you could say, the historical proof, the historical political proof of the end of uh, theodicy, in case one was uh, confused about the point, uh, confused about the issue. Um, Hauerwas, in his book on medicine, suffering, um, and theodicy, uses the example of terminally ill children. I'm convinced. I think if we were more sensitive, we'd be convinced by far lesser things. It's a sad testimony to our callous sensibilities. Um, so I guess that's how I would uh, answer that, although at this conference that would probably provoke, uh, or, or some people might want to disagree with that, that it's, it's, a histo it's for Levinas the, his the political historical, um, the unforgettable, paradigmatic end of theodicy. Um, but perhaps, and I'm sure it's true, there are sensibilities callous enough that even that doesn't do it. Right? This is the nature of human, you know, human life. Is that, does that answer your query there? I know you're studying this article, so you, you might have a, a, a response that I would want to hear. Well, I, I don't have a response, uh, but I'm not sure if you have a response. I'm not sure anyone has a response. Just follow up. It's, it's the same thing. It's just a I think we both see it the same way. But I, 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 uh, for me, it isn't a problem, but I'm sure someone could make it into one for me. Um, did, J Josh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, respond to that, sure. Uh, to respond to what you've said in the same way, that uh, it's only a result of our callousness that we need that, uh, for example, the idea that we need a state, that a state should be aiming for justice. Um, and again, of course, the Holocaust shows that here's a stateless people abused in part like the gypsies because of their statelessness. Um, we didn't need the Holocaust to know that, right? But if after the Holocaust we don't know that, then we are in worse shape than I, I thought we were. Yeah, so on. Uh, yes. beautiful way to ask the question because I'd be so tempted to say this is the inner truth finally revealed uh, through Levinas's work, uh, the, the, the hidden kernel of, uh, I think people have sincerely and for a long time believed in theodicy. There are, there are many commentaries, many uh, documents you can find to support that point of view. Levinas specifically uses the word mature and therefore he's distinguishing it from infantile. Uh, I don't know whether that could be useful in terms of, uh, from a developmental point of view, in terms of pedagogy, that at a certain, up to a certain age you can learn one point of view and then another. Um, 
Or uh, there's another distinction I think is useful. It's wrong for me to explain your suffering. But Levinas Nowhere says it's wrong for you to understand your own suffering from a, from a classical theological point of view. That is, there would be nothing wrong with me in my relation to God, understanding my suffering as punishment. It's only when I apply that to you that I've multiplied evil. So Levinas can have his cake and eat it. Although the obvious suggestion is that it would be immature of me to think of my suffering from the point of view of the Odyssey. I always think, and there, there are certain, you could bring down certain uh, Talmudic phrases, that when we have an insight, when our eyes are opened, when we truly learn something, that is the inner kernel. I, I really do think that. Judaism is peculiar in that way when, we, when I use the word Talmud. I include this conference as Talmud. This conference is Talmud. Right? This is Jewish spirituality. Judaism includes the university. The university is not sufficient for Judaism. <laughs> Back here is a comment. Do you mean the rescue, Jewish rescue of Jews, or that Jews are obligated to rescue Jews, or that anyone is obligated? Let, let me let me now if Boyd's in his um, in his published work has avoided uh, the halachic side of Judaism. His, his discourse is uh, agadic, philosophic, musar. It's very much musar. Um, which doesn't make it mushy or sentimental. It's, uh, it's a litvish, very strict intellectual uh, rigor. Um, but you don't see Levinas uh, committing himself in his writings one way or the other. Um, you'd have to then, you know, in terms of whatever your personal interest in Levinas would be, look at his, you know, his life and behavior. But that's, that's in a way irrelevant too. Uh, but no, I don't know of no instance where he mentions that. I might be wrong. but. Yeah. Yes. Should, we, should, should it be worse because it's a cultivated nation as opposed to an uncultivated? I, I, um, I don't see that that would be a factor. In, in fact, I, I think one of the results of these books like by Lifton on the, the doctors, and, and we know that the Einsatzgruppen were generally better educated than the population at large, is a very Levinasian point, namely knowledge and culture in and of themselves are no defense against immorality. It's only when knowledge and culture are linked to morality, grounded in morality. In fact, one of the dangers of a cultured nation is to get carried away by the aesthetic, the very seductive, attractive aesthetic dimension of life, um, and, and unmoor it from what keeps it human. Um, so certainly the horror would be just as bad in both, certainly in Levinas' names, Cambodia. Uh, not that I want to say, you know, they're less cultured, but, you know, they're not, uh, it's not, they're not, uh, I don't know what to say, not Bach. <laughs> you know? um, uh, so, no, I don't think that would be a factor. In fact, the danger would be greater in a more cultured culture. Yeah. You know that. You know that. People often mistake their cultural achievements for moral superiority. This is what Forrest Gump opposed. 
the movie, right, in a very simple, straightforward way, that cultural achievements are not the ground of moral superiority. Christianity, I think, teaches this lesson in a very strong way. The disciples are common, ordinary, uncultivated, simple people, and yet moral giants in the Christian worldview. Right? Judaism tends to exalt something else, you know, this learning scholarship, uh, but it's never detached from moral behavior. Yeah. Yes. Me? Oh, okay. I think, like all evil, it would be better if it had not have had if it didn't happen. It, it, it would have. It's always. There is no better response. We could reverse time. There might be. I, I mean, there's just no the irreversibility of time makes that the best, the best response. There are uh, agadic stories of rabbis after they pass away who refuse to go to uh, heaven because they they stay in an sort of intermediary zone, and they wait there because they insist that God dry those tears that were shed. That he undo all those tears. That's that's what you're asking, but that's in the dimension of heaven. That's that's not our best shot. Um, we don't know how to do that. So, I, sure, there's 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 an inadequacy. Levinas's philosophy is built on a crushing inadequacy, right here and now. Right. I think the paper yesterday uh, with the. Uh, the bystander uh, paper, that the inadequacy of our response, the failure. Many moral theorists will then attempt to fill in that gap, console us. Levinas refuses. But as for the past, uh, Yes. That my affliction would be understood as uh, my way to get a connection to, that would be my link to the affliction of the other. But what, again, let me emphasize, we're not talking here about just good or bad feelings. We're talking about that as a motivation, as I think you, 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 you certainly understand, to moral action. And then moral action is the ground of justice. There's a, there's a, there's a whole structure here. Um, it's not good enough to just 
It's not good enough just to suffer. Right? But it's the beginning of being good. It's our connection. Um, when someone said that no one is good voluntarily, citing Levinas, people are not good voluntarily because it hurts. It's a pain to be good. It's a burden. This is the great attraction of things like paganism. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yes? Well, I would think of uh, the sense in which you're using faith and prayer as, as again, post facto, that the passivity of suffering is deeper than prayer and faith. One has faith and one prays to undo the suffering, but the suffering comes first. Levinas wants to give it the, the strongest sense of passivity. It's more passive than, than even what he calls receptivity, as if I could synthesize and somehow get a grip on it. It's what I can't get a grip on. It's what escapes me, and I don't want it. I want to get rid of it, but I can't get rid of it. I'm trapped in it. That's why we pray. That's why we have faith. So, so it, is, it is deeper. Sure. Sure. Uh, Levinas doesn't specify that you have to have prayer or faith. He, he's not, uh, he's not um, as we saw yesterday in this discussion of saying and the said, the, the words won't uh, matter, but caring would be a fine word too. Caring would depend on undergoing, on suffering. Um, and without it, it would be, it would be missing something. Yeah. We've all seen that, I think, in our lives when you thought you were trying to do your best and then later you actually suffered the thing that you were trying to help when you realized how useless what you were doing was because you didn't, you didn't even come close to it, right? That's an experience we go through, unfortunately, but it's for the better of our caring. Uh, yes? The religious meaning of the Holocaust for Levinas is that it is now immoral to explain the Holocaust from a theological point of view or from any point of view. That this is no longer an option. That's the meaning of the Holocaust. But unlike some people who take that to mean God, Judaism is all over, religious morality, for Levinas that's the beginning of a mature morality and religion. So you might say that the Holocaust knocks the wind out. This is its theological punch. You know. uh, knocks the wind out of a immature religious point of view. You grow up. That's his answer, yeah. I think other, many, many people I think who have reflected on the Holocaust come up with this, and it's a question of how they want to say that. I, I use the word tremendum. You know, that, that was one way of trying to say it, but it, I don't think it goes far enough. Um, People try to articulate this excessive in moment that goes beyond anything we could say and what it means, recognizing that we, it's beyond explanation. So it's the very beyond explanation that is loving us. Is, that's what he wants to say about it. Yes? It never ends. Uh, you look at people like Mother Teresa and you think this woman has an enormous capacity for suffering. Um, it uh, ends when the world is redeemed. But I have not given, been given a schedule for that. <laughs> Our time is close to a close. Please join us. <laughs> Thank you.
for the benefit of our live, uh, live television audience, our next telecast will be the keynote address of Professor Jill Robbins this afternoon at 4 o'clock. She will be speaking on the topic of the frozen faces. Until then, thank you for joining us.